When working with BJTs, you obviously need to know which is the collector, base, and emitter in order to hook the thing up right, as well as if it's a PNP or NPN type transistor. Now the most obvious way to figure this out is with the datasheet, which presumably you got when you got the transistor. But I'm going to show you how to figure both of these things out, all of these things out, with just a multimeter. Now why? First of all, it can be quicker. The point at which you realize you don't remember which pin is which might be when it's on your bench, you're at your workbench, and you're about to try and put it in the board. And you don't have the datasheet handy, you probably have to go look it up on your phone or computer, but what you do have handy is a multimeter. And in the matter of seconds, you can just poke it and figure it out and you're done. Also, you can use it to make sure that the part you got is the part you ordered. This isn't really a problem when you buy in bulk of hundreds of thousands from some big retailer or distributor, I suppose, like Mouser. But for me, I got a box of them off of Amazon from somebody called Joe Knows Electronics, an assortment box. Great for a beginning hobbyist. And as it turns out, whatever cheap Chinese company produced one of the parts mislabeled it, and it's not the part it says it is. So this allows you to check that. There can also be conflicting data sheets. Once again, if you buy from a big company like Mouser, you'll have a data sheet from Mouser. But in my case, I just got a list of parts. So I have to Google and look at the data sheets from some other company and hope they use the same part number. Sometimes different companies might have different structures for the same part number because they have their own subpart number or whatever. So you could have two different data sheets that say two different things. That's not going to help. And maybe it's an old part in a very old device you're trying to diagnose. You can't read the label because it's worn off or it's covered in paint or goop, like thermal goop. So there are good reasons. So let me quickly show you what I'm going to do, and then I'll do it. A standard NPN and PNP BJT transistors, which is redundant. The T stands for transistor. But anyway, recall that if you only connect two pins, if you connect across collector to emitter and don't do anything with the base, then it's going to just block the current. There'll be a tiny bit of leakage maybe in the pico amps, but basically nothing will happen. Unless, of course, you apply 100 volts and blow the thing up. We're talking normally. Normally, if there's nothing on the base at all and you connect across collector to emitter, nothing happens. Same for the PNP. So if you connect your test meter one way across a set of pins, I'll show you how you connect it, but if you connect it one way and you connect it another for the same two pins and nothing happens in either case, that means that's the collector and emitter. You don't know which one's the collector and emitter, but if it's not passing current, whichever way you hook those two pins together, you know that's the collector and emitter. But your NPN transistor is an NPN layer. So if you connect only these two pins, you have an NP going this way, it's a PN. That's a diode. A PN junction is a diode. And here again, NPN, so PN. PN junction is a diode. And see, that's the direction the arrow's going. So if you connect only across the collector and base or emitter and base, and don't do all three pins, just those two, these two or these two, then it behaves just as a diode. And some people use it that way. There's actually certain cases where you need the function of a diode, but the physical properties of a particular transistor work better for that particular device. It's kind of interesting that way, that a transistor can make a better diode than a diode. But in any case, connect two pins there or two pins there, and you get a diode. So basically, try to apply a reasonably small current one direction and then the other. If it goes one way, then you know it's a diode that way. So for example, for the NPN, if you put current from base to emitter, let's say one volt with some small resistance, then you'll get current going from base to emitter but not emitter to base. And then you'll get current going from base to collector and not collector to base. For the PNP, it's opposite. PNP, so you've got a PN junction there and a PN junction here. Again, the arrow is pointing in the direction of one of the two PN junctions. So if you apply current from emitter to base, it'll go through. Base to emitter, it won't. Again, using only two pins. And then, as usual, collector to emitter or emitter to collector, it won't. So you have three pins. You basically pick two, see if there's current. If there is current, then one of the two you're touching is the base. Then flip it, and you'll know, again, that's the base because it won't conduct in the opposite direction. Then pick another one. If neither of them connects, now you've removed the base and you're on collector to emitter. So the pin that you're no longer touching, you know is the base. But 
if you get current one way and not the other, you know you're in a pin junction, and then you move one of the pins, move to another of the pins, and again, using the new pin, you get current in one way and then current in the other, you've found the other pin junction. So whichever pin did not move, that's the base. They'll always share the base. The two pin junctions will always share the base because collector to emitter won't conduct. The base has to be involved for it to conduct. So if you find two sets of pins that both conduct in one direction, the pin they share is the base. And anytime you find a pair of pins that don't conduct either way, that's the collector and emitter. So if you find two pins that don't conduct, you know which one's the base. There you go. Now you can tell it's NPN or PNP using that. If it's NPN, both will conduct out of the base, from base to collector, from base to emitter. So whatever pin is shared, applying current from that pin to another one will conduct and not the reverse. Whereas PNP, if you apply current from any pin that's not the base to the base, it will conduct. So you figure out which pin is the base by figuring out which pin is shared by both PN junctions. And then you figure out if it's NPN or PNP by seeing if the current is flowing into the base or out of it. The final trick is which one's the collector and which one's the emitter. As it turns out, these devices are doped slightly more in one direction than the other. Or rather, the emitter and collector are slightly different in how much they're doped. So you are going to get a higher voltage drop slightly by perhaps millivolts. You're going to get a very slightly higher voltage drop across the base to emitter junction, whether it's NPN or PNP. So from base to emitter on NPN or from emitter to base on PNP will be very, very slightly, perhaps even a couple millivolts higher than the base and collector pair. So let me show you. So your multimeter might have a diode test mode, which is on the same mode switch as the continuity check, the thing that beeps to see if there's a very low resistance. You should use this mode if you can because it's going to give you a more precise result. But this mode only works for regular diodes, which includes the PN junctions and the BJT, something that has around a 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volt voltage drop. It's generally not going to work right on other things. But if you don't have that mode, let me quickly show you. So what you can do is use a power supply. You can use any voltage source, but the power supply is easy. I'll configure it just for one single volt. No need to go higher, but higher will work as long as you have a reasonable amount of resistance. Go ahead and turn the current limit up a bit. So I have here roughly a 100 ohm resistor, which is plenty since we have just one volt. And I have a transistor I want to check. So if I connect from power through the resistor, from the resistor into one of the pins on the transistor, and from another pin on the transistor back to negative. Now we switch into volts mode, and I measure the voltage across those same two pins. You'll notice it says about one volt. This is millivolts, so it's taking pretty much the entire thing. So the entire voltage drop is across those two pins, which means current really isn't flowing. In fact, we can confirm if we measure across the resistor, you'll see that there's zero voltage drop across the resistor, and this is even more clear. Voltage equals current times resistance. Well, if voltage equals zero, current equals voltage divided by resistance, anything dividing into zero is zero. Zero voltage means zero current. So this is a PN junction that's blocking. So if we reverse it, if I reverse the two here, and measure there, now we're getting 742. And it's drawing current now. So this means we found one of our PN junctions. So you can use a power supply and a resistor and your multimeter in voltage mode to measure what's going on if you don't have a diode test mode. But I do, so I'll go ahead and use that. But you can use that if you need to. So I have in my board a 2N3904 NPN transistor, a BC550 NPN transistor, except We'll get to that in a moment. A 2N2222 NPN transistor, a BC327 PNP transistor, a 2N3906 PNP transistor, and an S9015 PNP transistor. So three NPNs and three PNPs, according to Joe Knows Electronics, except from what I'm about to show you, either Joe doesn't, or more likely, his supplier doesn't know electronics. The cheap Chinese supply company strikes again. So I will put 
my multimeter into diode mode. Now diode mode does the same thing I was doing with my power supply. It applies a small voltage and measures the resistance. It's basically resistance mode, except it's also got a resistor in there in series somehow to make sure nothing untoward happens. So if I short circuit it, it measures low resistance instead of frying. So if I put that across the first two pins, in that direction, I get about 809. You, go, you want to let it settle for a second. So we're getting 809, so that's 0 0.809 volts, 809 millivolts. If I flip the two, then it reads as an open circuit. This is higher resistance than this is measuring. For the sake of it, I'm just going to say from top to bottom is pin 1, 2, and 3. So we're getting a connection of 809 millivolts from 2 to 1 and no conduction from 1 to 2. So from 2 to 1 is a PN junction. Now, let's take pins 2 and 3. If I measure from pin 3 to 2, I get nothing. But if I measure from pin 2 to pin 3, I get, and we'll let it settle, about 814. That's higher. So the first thing we know is pin 2 is the base, because I got conduction from pin 2 to 1 and from pin 2 to 3. So we know pin 2 is the base. So 1 and 3 are the collector and emitter, or emitter and collector, whichever. Now, between pin 2 and 3, so from pin 2 to 3, we're getting 814 millivolts. From pin 2 to 1, we were getting 809. 814 is higher than 809, not by much, but it is. That's why you've got to let it settle to make sure you get an exact measurement. So that means pin 3 is the emitter. Base to emitter will have a slightly higher voltage drop than base to collector, or collector to base. So we know that pin 2 is the base, pin 3 is the emitter, so now we know that pin 1 is the collector. Furthermore, we're getting conduction from 2 to 1 and from 2 to 3. Current is going out of the base to the collector and out of the base to the emitter. That means, since current is going out of the base, it's an NPN. So now we know it's an NPN transistor, pins 1 through 3 are collector base emitter. And I'm obviously explaining this very slowly, but you can see, if you just tried to do this with your multimeter in a situation, it would have taken mere seconds to do that. So it is quick. Now, I'm going to skip this one for a moment. Let's measure this one. So we'll go from pin 1 to 2. Pin 1 to 2 gives me nothing. Pin 2 to 1 gives me, let's let it settle, 794 millivolts. So now I'll switch over pins 2 to 3 and I get 795, let's let it settle, 796. And since I already forgot what number I had, let me switch it back to 1. 793, that's already lower than 796. So once again, we know that pin 2 to 1 and pin 2 to 3 are our PN junctions. Current is going out of pin 2, which has to be the base because it's shared, which means it's NPN. And pins 2 to 1, this is 2 to 1, is lower than pins 2 to 3. So 2 to 3 is the emitter, 2 to 1 is the collector. So once again, collector, base, emitter. Let's move over to the PNPs. So that was our 2N3904 and 2N2222. This is our BC327. So this should be a PNP. So if I measure from pin 2 to pin 1, I get nothing. From pin 1 to pin 2, we let it settle. 833, final answer, 833. So from pin 1 to 2, which is opposite the ones we were doing before, but pin 1 to 2 is 833 millivolts. Now, let's measure from pin 3 to 2. So we get 831 millivolts. And once again, I forgot. So from pin 1 to 2 is 831. From pin 3 to 2 is 830. This one is giving us a little trouble. So I'm going to let it settle even harder. I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and wait and make sure this says 830. Oh, it's wiggling to 831. It's gone up to 831. Let's give it a second. There's thermal variations. So let's say 831 there. Now, similarly, I'm going to put it up through here. And now this one's at 832. So it looks like the current is warming this thing up very slightly, but we can see 832 there, move it down, settles at 831, move it up, settles at 832. So the top is the emitter. Pin two, once again, is shared between the two pairs. That's the base. So the top pin has to be the emitter, the bottom pin is the collector, and we're going from pin one to pin two and pin three to pin two. We're going into the base in both directions. So that means it's a PNP. Now this is where it breaks down a little bit because that took us quite a while to make sure. So we'd want to still consult the data sheet, but that was an exception. Let's try the 2N3906. If I connect from pin one to pin two, and I will remember the number this time, we let it settle, and it settles at about 819. And I switch from pin 3 to 2. So we had 819, now we're already far lower at 812. So we're already done. So it's the same as before. 
And yes, I did orient these to make sure this happens, but I'm still doing the demonstration. Pin 2 is shared between the two pairs that conduct, so pin 2 is the base. We get a higher voltage drop between pins 1 and 2 than pins 3 and 2. That means the top is the emitter, the bottom is a collector. And both are conducting into pin 2, into the base, so it's PNP. How about the S9015? So connect from pin 1 to pin 2. Once again, actually pin 1 and pin 2. And we let it settle on 824. Oh, 823, 823. So I switch to pin 3, and it's already 816. So, once again, pin 1 to 2 is higher than pin 3 to 2, and they're both going into 2. Emitter, base, collector, PNP. Now, what about this mysterious creature, the BC550? It's supposed to be an NPN transistor, and I have it oriented so that it's collector, base, emitter. I like to do it so that it matches the circuit diagram from top to bottom. Well, if... 2 is supposed to be the base, then we'll be conducting out of 2 into 1 and 3. Well, 3 is the emitter. Let's try that. Why does that say 0? Well, let's try 1. Why does that say 0? What's going on? How about from pin 1 to 2? From pin 1 to pin 2, now wait a minute, we're getting 816 millivolts. Settled on 816. So 816 from pin 1 to pin 2, from pin 3 to pin 2, 823. Perhaps 822? No, 823. Let's confirm. Let's switch it back to 1. 816, 815, settles on about 815. See how it varies with temperature. Switch it back to 3. 823, 822. So it's higher still. So we're conducting from pin 1 to pin 2 and from pin 3 to pin 2. That means 2 is the base. Between 3 and 2 is higher voltage than between 1 and 2, which means it is collector, base, emitter. But we're conducting in to the base. Once again, if the middle is the base, let's put a pin in the base, positive voltage in the base, to the collector, nothing. To the emitter, nothing. This is a PNP transistor. Very clearly on this box, the BC 550, I doubt you'll be able to read it, but if you can, great. The BC 550 is labeled as NPN. I scoured the internet. Everywhere labels the BC 550 as NPN. In fact, it's a series. It's something like the BC 546 to BC 550 is NPNs, and then BC 556 to BC 560 is PNPs, and their equivalent just swapped NPN and PNP. But what if it's labeled wrong on the box, you say? I checked. That package very clearly says 550 on it. I checked the entire bag of them. This bag that says BC 550, if it'll focus, this bag that says BC 550, I checked all over these. They all say BC 550, but it's not a BC 550. So you may not be convinced that this is faster or better. That's fine. Just use your data sheet. This is just another option, a quick little check you can do on your workbench. But if you're using parts from questionable sources, such as a variety pack off of Amazon, to my surprise, it's not always reliable. Great reviews, but not always reliable. And because the packages themselves, the actual devices, very clearly are printed BC550, I think that Joe is innocent in this. Joe knows electronics, the company I got it from. I think that for all he knows, they are BC550s. I think somebody in a Chinese factory somewhere hit a 5 instead of a 6 when they were setting up the printing for that run. And there's an entire batch of 560s that are printed as 550s and sold as 550s. 5 and 6 are right next to each other on the keyboard. And once that typo was made, well, it'll say 550 in the computer, it'll print 550, Joe will buy 550, it all cascades from there. One little mistake. So... You can use it to check your parts, and I'll be checking all of my transistors now to make sure they are what they say they are. And while I do that, I'll be seeing you.